Welcome to this session on the congenital myopathies. At this stage of our discussions, you are hopefully developing an appreciation for how extensive and varied muscular diseases can be. To make it easier to understand these various diseases, it helps to categorize them based on their similarities to one another. Hence, the muscular dystrophies, which tend to affect the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex, and the metabolic myopathies, which involve inborn errors of metabolism. Some diseases are a little more difficult to categorize. This brings us to the congenital myopathies. In this first session, we'll clear up some misconceptions based on the name and describe precisely what we mean by the term congenital myopathy. Let's start with a breakdown of the term itself. Myopathy is a term that you have already heard in relation to metabolic myopathies and will hear again with additional groups of disorders. The term itself means muscle suffering and is applied to a varied number of disease groups related to muscle tissue. The term congenital should also be quite familiar to you by now. It refers to an innate disease process that is present at birth. The term typically refers to genetic diseases, but also includes environmental factors that negatively impact fetal development. Thalidomide would certainly fall into this category. In contrast, acquired diseases are those which occur at a later point in time, such as infections and cancers. This is where the confusion comes in. If congenital myopathy refers to a muscle disease that has been inherited at birth, well, wouldn't most of the diseases we've already discussed qualify? That is to say, aren't muscular dystrophies and metabolic myopathies a form of congenital myopathy? Well, by strict definition, yes. But we tend to group these conditions based on other similar attributes that they share with one another, and which separates them from other congenital forms of muscle disease. This grouping leaves out an eclectic hodgepodge of conditions that can't really be grouped with the other large families of conditions. The term congenital myopathy is therefore reserved for these orphan conditions acquired at birth that don't necessarily fit into the other major classification systems. Most of these conditions involve structural deformities within the cell, so histopathological workup is more important than blood work in coming to a diagnosis. The table on the right displays a relatively comprehensive list of what are considered to be the congenital myopathies. This is not presented for memorization. It's just to give an appreciation for the diversity of the group of disorders. The traditional subgroups of disorders include myopathies with protein accumulations, myopathies with core, myopathies with central nuclei, myopathies with fiber size variation, and myopathies with vacuoles. Additional conditions listed at the bottom of the table can also potentially be grouped with these disorders. This is sometimes referred to as a heterogeneous group with heterogeneity. Not only can a single condition result from mutations in several different genes, but different mutations to a given gene can result in different clinical conditions. Even more perplexing, there have been reports of identical mutations resulting in different clinical outcomes based on confounding factors such as gene-gene interactions and of a presentation pattern changing over the lifespan of a single individual. This gives you a basic introduction to the congenital myopathies and how they are characterized. The remainder of the session will involve looking at two of these subgroups in a little more detail. First up are the myopathies with protein accumulation, with a focus on two specific types, the nemelin rod and internuclear rod diseases.